an extremely special part of the World Service Meeting in that Racy is going to lead us and lead all of you in the shares of the Serenity Prayer in your native languages. What I can't change, I have to change what I can change. And what I can change, I have to change. So, if that's no longer a catch, go so. Thank you, all of you. I heard it through the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collective voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hey, everybody, I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. Sam. Have you ever heard of the AA World Service Meeting? Well, I've heard of it. I've never spoken with anyone about it. So it's mm. a big gray area for me. I know it exists. I'm not entirely sure what the AA World Service Meeting is either. So I got out my super secret big red AA service manual and I found this. The World Service Meeting serves as a forum for sharing the experience, strength, and hope of delegates who come from all parts of the world. It seeks ways and means of carrying the AA message in any nation and any language. It can also represent an expression of the group conscience worldwide, and it's held every two years. Simply put, it's a sharing and learning opportunity for delegates from around the world, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. You know, when I walked into the rooms, I was always gazing at the floor. And as I got well, my gaze lifted. At first, AA was all about me. How can I stay sober? How can I stop being so miserable? What can I get out of a meeting? But working through the steps, I learned I had to lift my gaze to helping others which at first was helping to set up the meeting, making coffee, greeting newcomers, stuff like that. And then perhaps taking a service position to help the group, like secretary, treasurer, perhaps GSR. That's general service representatives who go to district meetings and report back. Yeah. And then I began to see my group is supported by the district. And beyond that, the area and the General Service Conference and AA World Services supporting AA all over the globe. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, North America. <laughs> well, um, Canada and the U.S. Don, we got to get this figured out. We do. So I'm really interested in our guest today from AA World Services. It's really all about helping others, helping the still suffering alcoholic. And Racy and Trish will be joining us, and we'll learn a little bit about their recovery and what they do in AA. But now, for news! The Grapevine is seeking stories from active and veteran members of the military. Did you ever serve in the military sober? Were you ever stationed overseas or on a ship while trying to stay sober? What were AA meetings like in the military? What were some of the challenges? Did you find AA while serving? Tell us about being in AA while serving your country. Stories are due by February 15, 2023. Submit them at aagrapevine.org slash share. And now a word from our sponsors. We don't have sponsors? What are you thinking? Oh yeah, we don't do the commercial sponsor thing. Since the grapevine is self-supporting, we don't sell ad space in our magazine, on our website, or in our podcast. Grapevine doesn't even accept donations from AA members. If you want to support Grapevine and this podcast, visit aagrapevine.org slash store. My name is Trish. I'm an alcoholic. I live in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Yes, home of the 2025 International Convention. Woohoo! My home group is Reflections. Uh, we meet Thursday nights at 7.30. We're a hybrid meeting. We, we meld. We're melded hybrid. There are so many <laughs> definitions. I currently have a service position that you all gave me, whether you know it or not. You elected me. 
I'm the trustee at large. I sit on the general service board, elected from Canada. So, ah. so that's that's me right now. What a treat to be here. Thank you. So glad you're here, Trish. Hello, my name is Ray CJ. I am an alcoholic. And I also serve as a GSO staff person at the General Service Office for the U.S. and Canada. I currently serve on the international desk. I've worked at GSO since uh, 2013, and now I've had the pleasure of serving as the international coordinator for a little over a year. I work a lot and try to support the trustees international committee, and I work a lot with Trish and we have each other on speed dial and and Wednesday night is my favorite night of the week. My home group is in Brooklyn, New York. They uh, keep it real for me and keep it humble for me and so that I can come back and be spiritually fit and do my job at the office. My recovery, I keep very separate from my work day. So thank goodness for them. So you're an active member of AA. I am an active member of AA, and that's very important. Even though I say the letters AA all day long, (laughs) and uh, even though GSO employs many people who are not AA members, but at the end of the day, I still have my sponsor, I have my steps. Well, Racy, what happened to you that caused you to go to AA? Hmm. Why would you do such a thing? Well, there was a line of people who kept telling me to go. As long as there were people still in my life, I thought I was still winning. My very first AA meeting, my father took me to uh, when I was 16 years old. And I wouldn't land until I was 28 years old. I'm somebody Mm. who, you know, though I didn't think it at the time, all the checks that I feel like I need to have happened, happened. And when I thought the bottom would never come, it came. And pretty much when there was no one left to tell me to go back to AA. And I was somebody who was in and out, in and out. I thought I was one of these people who was just not capable of getting honest, you know, not Mm -hmm. capable. I, I didn't know what it looked like. I'd sit in the rooms of AA and I think maybe this is it. Maybe this is what they're talking about and what would take me out every time. It was usually resentment. I was institutionalized a lot. Uh, It was really the seed that was planted by people in AA. While I was pretty messy inside of AA, there was always hope. I don't have a ton of memory of the end, but I remember waking up on a park bench, March 12th, 2002, and I looked up at the sky and some wave came over me that said you could go back to AA and it said you're not getting away with anything the fact that I even had the glimpse of hope that it could be done that's the most finite higher power I've ever been in touch with was that day that moment Uh, Mm -hmm. it is that desperation and that's what all alcoholics seem to have is a point of complete utter despair tell me what to do. What could you say to somebody who's coming in and out of AA and doesn't know what they're missing? Don, I do not fully know how this works. I'm a sucker for the wet drunk, you know, and that's something my sponsor, she's very much, have you helped a drunk today? I'm kind of known for the person who will show up, take somebody with the paper bag and the beer can and the cab to the ER and so forth. And one of the biggest blessings and curses in recovery is when you find yourself saying the things and being in the position where you're on the other side and watching yourself saying things that you know don't work when somebody's got that alcohol in them already. You know, all the things people said to me, you're telling yourself, mm-hmm. can't you see what you're doing? You're driving this person, you know, what happened to you, Racy? You're going to die, Racy. you know, and, and I can watch myself saying. And so what I've landed on is I typically say, I can't tell you what this is going to look like for you, but this is what the moment looked like for me in case it comes along and you want to know maybe how to spot it. And the other thing I can say is, I have a vision for you and AA has a vision for you. AA was made for you. I hear you. I get it. 
Racy, the biggest thing that shows up for me for these folks that are not quite ready yet is that I remain available. Trish. Thank you. That's just so beautiful. Racy reminded me and you reminded me too, Don. you know, when, when I was um, struggling, I mean, my story is not dramatic at all, but really it was just the, a very desperate woman getting up in the morning to go to work, to earn the money, to stop at the jar store on the way home, to get home to drink until I passed out, to get up in the morning, to go to work, to earn the money. It was just that cycle, right? Just around and around and around. And I had basically, I had had isolated myself from everyone else in my life, although people did still hold out hope for me. And I'm so grateful for that. But, you know, there was a, there was a moment, um, my, my sobriety date is February 19th, 1994. And Um, There was a moment, though, in 1991 where I called Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know why to this day. I, I, you know, it was higher power at work. It was a normal day. I had the requisite amount of white wine in me because, you know, red wine makes your tongue go a different color. And it was before I believed the lie that the lie that, you know, um, vodka doesn't smell. There is a special place in hell for people who started that particular myth. (laughs) Just a special circle. And I don't know how I even knew how to call AA. But for me, you know, that first phone call to Alcoholics Anonymous was that introduction to the literally thousands of people that I owe my sobriety to, that I will never meet, who will never necessarily know the impact they had on my life, right? And that person in the Vancouver Central Office volunteer phone room picked up the phone and knew what to do when he had a live one on the line. He got two people to come and 12-step me and take me to my first meeting, which was extraordinary. But, you know, I didn't stick around because I hated it. I I had no problem admitting I was powerless over alcohol. I had known that for a long time. I did not believe my life was unmanageable. I chose to believe that lie of, like, all the emotional instability, the marriages that I knew. There were all kinds of reasons for that. Not alcohol, don't you know? Alcohol was the solution. It wasn't the problem. So I just, I couldn't go there at that point. But... I went to AA. I, I I hated it. I just wanted someone to tell me I didn't belong. I don't think you go to a meeting of alcoholics and I'm going to ever have anyone tell you you don't belong there, right? But but that was my brain at work, you know. I went to one meeting a week, this meeting, so I could tick the box if I had a home group. I could, you know, I read the big book like a novel, so I could tick the box of reading the the big book. And I got a sponsor that I knew I would never call and would never call me, so I could tick those three boxes. So of course, you know. And what I did was, you know, I, I don't use a gentle word like relapse. But I really, I chose to drink again. I, there was nothing that was replacing the alcoholic thinking. It was still untreated alcoholism, right? I just wasn't drinking. I was dry. I still couldn't sleep at night. I still couldn't deal with the guilt. I still didn't know. I was still struggling. And so I drank. I drank for as long and as hard as I could. And I just remembered this when Racy was sharing. There was a woman named Rose in that first home group. And she would call me at least once a month and leave a message, okay, 1991, leave a message on my answering machine, just saying, hi, Trish, it's Rose from the East Burnaby group. I just want you to know we're thinking about you. Take care. And that was one of the things that made it possible for me to come back. So that, that question in terms of what do you tell someone who's out there, you know, when I think about the compassion and humanity that went into that, you know, at least once a month phone call that I never returned, right? But I knew where to come back to. That's a higher power at work for me. That's how I recognized the unconditional love when I got to AA. You know, there was hope in your eyes. There was love in your eyes. You were doing for me things that for for no reason that I could see, right? It was like, you know, when I was drinking, boy, if I did something for you, you owed, you you owed me big time. (laughs) And I would let you know what it was that you owed me. Everything was transactional. Keeping track. You bet. I had the list, right? And so when I got serious about getting sober, when I did come back, that act of desperation, that bottom, I got arrested for impaired driving at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning in the parking lot of the Vancouver Trade and Convention Center. 13 years later, I was the delegate for Area 79, and I was going to the Trade and Convention Center to work on the bid for the international, right? Like I pulled into the parking spot on the day that I bottomed 13 years later with just weeping with gratitude, going, how does a life turn around to that extent? But, you know, Mm. the officer who arrested me, this is the remarkable thing, too. He didn't throw me in the drunk tank, which is where I deserved to be. I'd been drinking all the way through the night the night before, and I had driven downtown for a work gig. 
he didn't throw me in the drunk tank. He turned me over to victim services because somehow, somewhere along the line, some public information work or some cooperation of the professional community work or personal experience, I don't know which, but certainly people that I owe my sobriety to, to owe my recovery to, had introduced this person to Alcoholics Anonymous in a way that made impossible to see hope in me. So, you know, when you combine that police person with the person who answered the phone and the wonderful members of that first home group and Rose calling me periodically and then examples in my own family that were there that I didn't even know about. It's all those series of small, small miracles, which for me were that that indication of, of something so much bigger than me. Wow. Yeah. I really love how you're talking about how people out in the world who are not alcoholics are able to help us, that hope exists in that place too. So Alcoholics Anonymous, AA World Services in New York City is not the AA World Office. It is the office of AA for Canada and the U.S., right? Oh, you're so good. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yes. But the work that you're doing is helping these other offices in other countries and locales to do what has been found here that works and helping them find the way that works for them. Can you talk a little bit about that? I'm a volunteer, right? I'm a trustee. I sit on the general service board. So the general service board is, you know, is that group of 21 people who sit at the very bottom of our upside down triangles. And we have two corporate boards as well. One is Alcoholics Anonymous World Services and one is AA Grapevine Inc., right? And uh, on the general service board among our trustees, our 21 trustees, 14 of us are alcoholic and seven of us are non-alcoholic. So class A trustees are non-alcoholic and the class B trustees. The boozers. The boozers, the amateurs and the boozers, right? Yeah. Class A is the amateurs and the B the boozers. So um, among those alcoholic trustees, two people are elected as trustees at large. So I'm trustee at large elected from Canada and Marita R from Nevada is the current trustee at large for the United States. And we both have the incredible privilege of serving as the, the sort of international representatives for the board in terms of our, our world communications. So Marita and I serve as world service meeting delegates. There are four zones altogether worldwide. U.S. Canada is part of a zone that is called GRADELA, which is the Spanish acronym for Meeting of the Americas, which is just beautiful. I love that name. So it's Canada, the United States, Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and South America. That's our home zone. It's huge. It's fabulous. When Bill was envisioning the World Service Meeting, he soon realized that in order to apply the traditions and the concepts and the steps in a manner that's going to be effective for the alcoholic that's next door to you, it has to be determined at that local level so that by supporting other structures around the world, we will help carry the AA message. But so wait a minute. So it's not to dictate. This is incredible thing about Bill. He was so forward thinking. It's hard for me to get my mind around it sometimes that he would think, well, we don't need to go out and get people sober. We need to percolate in each region of the world. It needs to arise up and we just want to be available in some way to help fertilize it or whatever. Is that right? Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's both visionary and practical at the same time. I mean, Bill had the big visions for Alcoholics Anonymous. But you're so right in terms of that revelation of his, which he then expressed in terms of the need for, for, for individuals, for groups, for districts, for areas, for countries to be able to determine their own Alcoholics Anonymous destiny. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's something else in there that that's speaking to me. Just like I needed another alcoholic to talk to me, so I was able to relate to what they had to share and see myself. Imagine me trying to do that with someone in India. It's really unlikely that they're going to relate to my story because of a huge cultural difference, a language difference, a lot of things going on there. So someone who is much more regionally close to that person is probably going to get a greater sense of relating. There's that commonality we all have as alcoholics. And, and I think one of the beauties of AA opening up so quickly during the pandemic and the ability for all of us to go to meetings all around the world, which we all have, 
is that recognition of commonality. But it's really true that how I experience the world is shaped by the world around me. I, we call ourselves a clearinghouse. You know, we have more years, right? Marita likes to say we're older, right? <laughs> we're just older. <laughs> and I think that's part of where the international desk and where, where Racy's current position actually comes in is in that sharing of collective um, yeah. experience, strength, and hope. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think Racy can talk about the, the amazing yes. things. Well, that come I'll, I'll, her desk. I'll even just give an example. Uh, last week, I was in Bahrain. Bahrain is in the Middle East. Was that virtually or did you actually go uh, to Bahrain? I went in person. Typically, the international desk travels if they're invited. Certainly, that's been slowed down and yeah. I did not travel as much as my predecessors. There is something undeniable for anyone who has traveled, whether it's from New York to Pittsburgh to, you know, uh, Detroit to... Uh, to Bahrain. Uh, uh, you know, to Bahrain <laughs> of a commonality feeling when you go in and hear the preamble read or hear somebody introduce themselves as an alcoholic, uh, see those steps on the wall, wh- whatever it may be. I have not been to a place anywhere in which I, I don't know I'm amongst fellows. Oh, yeah. What is different is that we're sometimes interacting with structures that are not decades old, you know, that have not been around as long. And so part of my assignment on the desk, it's very important that I not share from my desk saying, well, we do it this way. (laughs) Because, Because if I'm talking with the structure that's in their first 10 years, I will put them in touch with a structure, a country that may have more applicable shared experience. Can you give an example of what you're talking about? That's really general. (laughs) If I threw a, you know, and said, this is our service manual, do it like this. Mm -hmm. That's not what we were doing even in 1942, you know, or, you know, and so, and I really pay attention Uh, for me to keep extensive files in a repository so that I can say, let me see if I have sharing on this subject. Are we happy to share our experience, strength, and hope from the U.S.-Canada structure? Absolutely. But we also don't want to create a pressure that it has to look like our structure. So it sounds like we're back to fertilizing. (laughs) So the theme of the 27th World Service meeting was carrying the message of AA in the digital age. It was certainly very timely, but there are no decisions for the entire world being made at the World Service Meeting. It's an opportunity to share. They decide what topics they want to talk about. If they make policies, the policies are only for the World Service Meeting and not for AA as a whole. And the structure of the World Service Meeting is great. I mean, you know, there are some things that would be very familiar, you know, workshops, right? Getting together in small groups and talking about specific topics, Um, the general sharing sessions, right? The what's on your mind sessions, the the ask a basket Mm -hmm. sessions, same, same. You know, it's it's a way to impart the information about checking in where we all are. And I think one of my favorite parts of the World Service Meeting is the country highlights, you know, and you can read those, but it's not the same as hearing from the delegates and hearing that language of the heart in terms of what's important to their structure right now, what's going on there that we can both learn from, as Racy said, and relate to and sort of think, wow, maybe there's some insight here that can really help. First, Trish, and then Racy, what's a a thing that you heard at the World Service meeting, an idea that percolated up that was discussed that has really meant something to you? I think overall, for me, this particular World Service meeting, there are some really interesting challenges as we're coming out of the pandemic. There are countries that were so affected by COVID. When you think about a country like Peru, which lost a huge percentage of its population, let alone its AA population, to COVID and how that has carved out Mm. their service workers, like those kinds of impacts, Mm. those are stunning. You know, prior to the World Service meeting, 
um, my staff assistant, Victor, and I were working to try to make it that the delegate from Cuba could attend. To attend virtually? You mean? Yes. So there can be more challenges from Cuba, but we were determined to make this work. And then there was a hurricane. We were able to pull off. Um, my staff assistant, Victor, worked with the delegate from Cuba to record his country highlight. <laughs> And we got his permission to play this video recording for the World Service Meeting delegates. He sat in the back of a car mm. and just told us what AA looks like in Cuba today. You know, the challenges, what's what, how wow. they're carrying the message, what it looked like that week. Wow. Also, Iran was having challenges in their attendance on and off because of loss of internet connection. And it really created that feeling of all of us grateful to even have the ability to complain about being online. <laughs> I'm sitting here, I'm teary-eyed right now listening yeah. to you talk about this. <laughs> For that to impact me that hard really tells me that Ahey has worked a number on me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. Thank you for doing this work. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm going to, you don't have to keep it, but I'm going to tell you one more quick story. Okay. Uh, something that's a custom at the World Service Meeting is at the end, it's typical to close with the serenity prayer. And we say that even though people have participated in Spanish or English, that they can say the serenity prayer in the language that feels the way they hear AA. And so I collected all the countries and we started to announce them one by one. And we had about 30 languages in which we heard the serenity prayer. And at first, you know, you think, oh, it's the serenity prayer. This is really beautiful. You know, I'm hearing it all these different languages, but each delegate started to pop up on screen and maybe one or two would say it in each, you know, whether it's Slovakian or uh, Swedish or, you know, uh, Ukraine or whatever it may have been. And then I started to realize why it became so moving for me was because I realized that those delegates that I was watching up on screen were there because somebody had carried the AA message in a language in which they understood. When we talk about the language of the heart, when the hand of AA, we are here because the message was transmitted in a way that we could receive it. And that's what that moment really spoke. Thank you. I will say that uh, for those interested in reading more about the World Service Meeting, currently there is an AA Around the World page on AA.org. We will be posting the final report in 2023 of this World Service Meeting there so people can read about it. Racy, thank you. Trish, is there something that you didn't get to share that you'd like to? I just wanted to add... This is less World Service Meeting and more about our relationships. Bob W., the GSO general manager, and I were actually in Bolivia. Travel to Bolivia from the west coast of Canada, it's long, but it, it's, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to go. Bolivia is going through a period of a certain amount of civil unrest, and there was a, a question about whether or not the convention that we were attending would even be able to happen. But it was going ahead, so we, we traveled. We got to um, the general service office for Bolivia is in the city of Santa Cruz, which is a big city. And it was kind of the center of some of the unrest. The convention was happening in a smaller city um, where it wasn't quite so fraught. But we made our way to the general service office. And the general service office manager there is a wonderful man named Chiki. And we got there and he came to greet us at the door and he had tears in his eyes and he said, you came. <laughs> You came and and it was, you know, that moment of a 12 step call where letting people know that that we're not alone. None of us are alone. We don't do any of this alone. The depth of his gratitude for having visitors come from US Canada was so deep. 
and that was such a moving moment. And that's what this work is. It's it's a 12 step call. And neighbors asked us to come in and share experience, strength and hope. And I will never forget that moment. I will never forget Cheeky and what we do. Okay, you made me it. cry too. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to both of you for uh, being the hand of AA. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am so glad to get to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Hi, this is Tatiana P. from Durham, North Carolina, and I have an Al-Anon joke. How many Al-Anons does it take to screw in a light bulb? None. They just detach and let it screw itself. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine, Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find AA Grapevine on Instagram and the AA Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit aa.org.